Howdy, folks. Thanks for checking in to Mr. Ulrich's Land of Biology.com. I am Mr. Ulrich. In this Little Notes cast, we're going to be introducing the concept of metabolism. That is the sum total of all of the chemical reactions that take place within an organism. And we'll talk a little bit about the enzymes that make metabolism possible. Well, if metabolism is all of the chemical reactions of life, then life then is basically a symphony of interactions between matter and energy. Because that's what a chemical reaction really is, an interaction between matter and energy. And in these interactions, uh, many of them, some of them, uh, the energy is actually transformed from one form to another. Remember, uh, energy cannot be created nor destroyed. It can only be transformed from one form to another. Uh, so, of course, the ultimate source of energy for living things, for all intents and purposes, is the sun. Yeah, I know, we got some other things we can talk about there, but it, generally speaking, uh, the sun is the source of energy for most living things. Uh, that solar or light energy is then converted by the uh, autotrophs uh, into chemical potential the uh, bond energy that it takes to hold the atoms and molecules together in compounds like ATP, which is going to be used for energy by the uh, autotroph itself, and the organic molecules that make up the autotroph in the first place. And then herbivores come along. They can't use lights, light energy uh, and convert that into uh, chemical potential, but they certainly can take the organic molecules that make up the plants and use the chemical potential in those organic molecules to make energy for themselves to run, hop, skip, jump, and play, and to also uh, synthesize those organic molecules that make up their own bodies. And then the carnivores come along, they eat those organic molecules that made up the herbivores, and use that energy, that chemical potential, to make their own energy, their own ATP molecules, um, uh, and make their own organic molecules for their own bulk. Uh, and of course, energy cannot be made, right? They are transferring the energy from the organic molecules of the giraffe to the organic molecules. Um, all of those chemical reactions then can be broken into basically two categories. We have the chemical reactions that involve forming bonds, building things up by synthesis, right? Uh, we refer to these as anabolic reactions or anabolism. Think about why a uh, weightlifter might be uh, motivated to try anabolic steroids because they're trying to build more muscle mass, more bulk. Uh, dehydration synthesis, of course, a classic example of an anabolic reaction. Uh, on the flip side, we have those uh, uh, reactions that break bonds, uh, like digestion, takes larger molecules and breaks it into smaller molecules. We refer to this as catabolism, breaking things apart. Uh, hydrolysis being the prime example of a catabolic reaction. So let's look at those prime examples a little closer. Here's uh, dehydration synthesis. We're taking two what look like glucose molecules, and we're going to glue them together by removing a water molecule from between the two of them. We've seen this before. And hydrolysis involves just the opposite, taking that disaccharide, adding water, using uh, the atoms in water, the two hydrogens and the oxygen, uh, to uh, break those um uh, break that disaccharide into two and satisfy um, the bond requirements for the two new molecules. These things don't happen on their own. All of these chemical reactions need enzymes. We'll get a little bit more into that in a second. Let's look at the structural formulas in the dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis of sucrose. Uh, here, in order to get uh, this fructose and glucose to uh, bond together, we got to remove an OH and an H from one. Uh, forming a water molecule, and that allows this bond here to be formed between the oxygen of one hydroxy and the carbon of the other uh, glucose in this case. Uh, and in hydrolysis, now we got to take this water molecule and stick it right in there, uh, breaking it apart and allowing those two different um, products to be. These things don't happen on their own. In order to get those molecules to actually clonk together in just the right trajectory so that uh, the bonds can be formed and broken, we need enzymes, and we'll talk about those here in a moment. So we've talked about uh, the matter in chemical reactions. Now we need to talk about the energy in chemical reactions. Uh, we can break up these chemical reactions of metabolism into two categories. We've got the chemical reactions that release energy. These are what we called exergonic uh, X for outward, so uh, they produce the energy outward. 
uh, most of these are catabolic reactions because when we're digesting molecules through catabolism, you're taking a much more organized molecule and breaking it up into smaller, less organized molecules. So you're going from a higher energy state in that highly organized large molecule to lower energy state in those uh, smaller molecules. Uh, the other chemical reactions can be uh, that we're talking about here require the input of energy. These are endergonic, so endo would be inward, uh, and most of these are anabolic in nature. And we're just doing the reverse of the catabolic. So we're going from molecules that um, are small, uh, lower, you know, smaller and less organized at a lower energy state, and building molecules that are more organized, which takes more energy. So a picture's worth a thousand words, right? Let's take a look at a picture here. Uh, on the y-axis is uh, free energy, right? You can think of this free energy, um, also known as big G. Uh, you can think of that almost as heat. It's the energy out there in the system, um, the energy of other molecules, atoms and molecules in the system kind of clonking into one another. Um, in order to get this uh, exergonic reaction to take place, all right, um, where energy is going to be released, we always have to put some energy in, and that's going to become important here in a second when we start talking about activation energy. But when we digest these uh, reactants here, uh, we're going to put some energy in to get those um, uh, atoms and molecules to clonk around a little bit more and uh, cause those bonds to weaken. And once they get weak enough, they break. And now uh, the products actually represent less energy in the products than there were in the reactants. And so that energy actually is released to go clonking into the other molecules to do stuff. All right, we refer to that uh, change in free energy as delta G. And in the case of exergonic reactions, that's a negative delta G. Um, and so, like we said, that's a uh, that change in the free energy and the ability to do work. If we look at an endergonic reaction, these are the ones where energy has to be put in, uh, like in a synthetic reaction, although the reaction in this diagram is not synthetic. Um, we're starting out with uh, one reactant and getting several products here, so this would be a catabolic reaction. But in this in this catabolic reaction, uh, you you. You have to put in more energy to get this to start than you get out once the reaction is done. Um, so in this case, uh, when we look at the delta G here, now we're looking at a positive delta G. All right. If this reaction, if when you if you have an endergonic reaction going on, say in a, in a beaker, or you put your hand on it, you'll actually it'll actually feel cold. Um, whereas an exergonic reaction, you'll feel a little. So if, if, if these reactions, many of these reactions require energy, where does the energy come from? It's pretty easy to see that we can get um, digestive, digestive processes, anabolic processes, excuse me, catabolic processes to go on because those produce energy. But how do we get those um, anabolic processes, the ones that are synthetic to go on because they require the input of energy? Well, what we do is we actually couple reactions. So we kind of stick them together so that the energy that is released from digestion can then be transferred um, to the chemical reactions uh, that uh, put molecules together, the synthetic chemical reaction. So if some of these reactions actually end up with uh, energy being released, why don't the energy, why, excuse me, why don't these chemical reactions just happen on their own? Why don't they just happen spontaneously? Yeah, sure, when you take starch and you uh, digest it and break it apart, more energy comes out of the breaking apart of the starch molecules into uh, glucose and then eventually carbon dioxide and water than, uh, you, than, than, was, than you put into it to get the process to start. So burning or breaking down or digesting starch is an, uh, is an exergonic reaction. But why doesn't it happen on its own if it's something that's just, if it's going to proceed kind of downhill, like we say? Um, well, those covalent bonds that are holding the glucose molecules to one another and holding the glucose, mo the, the atoms in the glucose molecule itself together uh, are very stable and it's going to take a bunch of energy in order to start breaking those bonds down. That energy that it takes to uh, start the breakdown of larger molecules is called activation energy. 
Uh, and a good example of this is uh, fire. I heat my house with wood. Wood is made mostly out of cellulose, lignin. And uh, wood doesn't burn on its own, thankfully. Otherwise, I'd have a problem with my wood pile outside. Uh, you have to give it a little bit of energy to start the process. Once you give it a little bit of energy to start breaking apart the molecules of glucose and cellulose, well, cellulose and then uh, glucose into carbon dioxide and water, yeah, you're going to generate some heat. And that heat is going to be enough to continue breaking down the other glucose and other cellulose that's there. So it's kind of like a you got you to gotta start the chain reaction. And then once it gets going, that chain reaction is going to continue on. The heat that is released is going to power the breakdown of the other molecules until you run out of fuel molecules. So we have to add that activation energy uh, in order to get the wood to burn. Uh, because wood is stable. And you got to give it a whole bunch of energy. So how do organisms then overcome this activation energy problem? Because there is it, it takes way too much energy to destabilize the bonds of a molecule um, than, than, than uh, organisms can provide to get that reaction to go over that energy hill, that, that mound of activation energy that's needed. So yeah, we could we can put a flame to uh, firewood and get it started, but we can't put a flame to glucose and get its breakdown started, right? Because it's just too much energy. So how do cells get over this uh, activation energy problem? Uh, we employ catalysts. And in the case of living things, those catalysts are called enzymes. So what a catalyst does is it takes uh, this huge activation energy hill here and it lowers it. All right, so it takes a lot less activation energy to get that uh, reaction to start. So enzymes then can be defined as biological catalysts. They're made out of proteins, some have some RNA involved in them, and their job is to help chemical reactions take place. Um, the cool thing about enzymes is that they do their action of getting reactions to take place faster than they normally would by lowering the activation energy. But once they're done doing that, uh, they're not used up. They can go and catalyze another reaction. All right, so they again they, they reduce the activation energy, but they don't change the amount of energy that is released or required uh, once the reaction is over. So they're really only involved in getting the reaction to start, and then they're not involved. So an exergonic reaction stays just as exergonic with a catalyst or not, and an endergonic reaction the same. Um, now. Since most of these chemical reactions of metabolism aren't going to take place without some sort of catalyst, um, and enzymes are very, very specific in their action, that means that uh, each chemical reaction is going to need its own enzyme. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands of different chemical reactions that take place, and therefore there are thousands and thousands of different enzymes that need to be produced in cells in order to catalyze those reactions. And it's really the enzymes that are driving life. In middle school, when you were talking about the nucleus of the cell controlling the cell's activities, remember, the nucleus is really just a repository of uh, very complex information. It's a very complex repository. Um, but what it does is the nucleus uh, has the codes to make the enzymes, and it's the enzymes that go out and really are driving the cell around and uh, um, controlling chemical reactions. So let's get our uh, words together so that we can have a conversation about these things. All right, the enzyme down here has its particular shape, uh, like we said, uh, and that shape allows it to bond to a particular substrate. All right, so the substrate then, that's the thing that binds to the enzyme. In this case, it looks like a little sucrose. Once it binds, it's, uh, it, we, we call it the enzyme substrate complex, all right? And those are uh, uh, really kind of weak bonds, uh, hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds usually. Uh, and then the chemical reaction takes place, and we end up with the products. Of course, the uh, uh, enzyme then goes off and can catalyze another reaction. Uh, the part of the enzyme itself where the substrate fits is called the active site. And again, it has to have just the right shape and conformation in order for that substrate to fit. So 
enzymes then are what we say reaction specific. Right? Each enzyme has a specific substrate that it works on uh, because it has to be just the right shape for those hydrogen bonds and ionic bonds to form between the active site and the substrate itself. Uh, they're not used up in the reaction so that w well, one enzyme can go out and cause lots and lots and lots of chemical reactions to take place um, because they're not used up. They're not, uh, they are unaffected by the uh, chemical reaction itself. However, they are affected by um, the same things that would affect uh, protein uh, uh, shape are going to affect uh, the enzyme activity since they are proteins. So changes in temperature, in pH, and salinity all can change the shape of the protein interact, uh, uh, interfering with the bonds that are holding the protein together in its uh, tertiary quaternary structures, causing them to kind of soften up. The names of enzymes tell us a lot about enzymes. Uh, first off, most of them will have the suffix ACE. And then the prefix tells you a little bit about either its action or the uh, substrate that it works on. So sucrase breaks down sucrose, proteases break down proteins, lipases break down lipids. DNA polymerase tells us a little bit about what it does. All right, it polymerizes DNA, so it adds those nucleotides together and makes a long polymer of DNA. Pepsin is an example of a protease and a, an enzyme that doesn't end in ACE. Uh, pepsin uh, breaks down proteins in your stomach. Oftentimes when we're describing the mechanisms of enzyme action, how they actually do their job, we use the good old lock and key model. It is a little bit simplistic, but it does work uh, because it does involve uh, the th how the, the 3D structure of the enzyme and the substrate need to fit together in a shape-to-shape -shape, uh, interaction to allow those hydrogen bonds between the substrate and the enzyme to form. So this is a lot like how the key fits into the lock, right? The key doesn't change. Um, the lock changes. So we have the uh, enzyme would be like the key and the substrate would be like the lock. Now, a much better or accurate way of describing how enzymes work is the induced fit model. Uh, this also indicates that the 3D structure of the enzyme has to fit with the substrate, but in this case, once that substrate binds to the enzyme, there's actually a conformational change in the enzyme itself. So you can see up here, once the substrate fits in here, uh, these little like jaws here kind of clamp down on the substrate itself uh, giving you that tighter fit and bringing those chemical groups that need to be in just the right orientation uh, together so that that reaction can happen much easier. So how does this all actually take place? Well, in the case of uh, synthetic reactions, the way that uh, enzymes cause the lowering of activation energy uh, is by having those substrate molecules in just the right position, right? They bond to the active site and that holds them together in just the right spot um, for the reaction to take place. Uh, in digestive catabolic reactions, um, that change in the enzyme and the uh, the conformational change in the induced fit model there will actually put put like bond stress on the substrates itself and that makes it a, that much easier to uh, separate those molecules to break the bonds. Well, we'll stop there. We'll certainly get a lot more detail into different pathways of metabolism and uh, far more specific with uh, individual enzymes and how they work. Uh, but for now, we'll leave it there. If you have questions, feel free. Drop me an email. Go to mrolertslandabiology.com uh, and click on the email link and uh, uh, ask away. Questions, comments, concerns, cliches, cataclysms, anything. Let me know. Thanks. We'll see you in class.